so now I want to talk about a, a project that I did with uh, Ravi, who's now at the University of Brussels. Um, and it's yeah about contextuality in composite systems, specifically uh, mostly multi-qubit systems. Um, so as a premise, uh, qubits are useful, uh, I guess, Quite a lot of you use them uh, in various applications, maybe quantum computation or quantum information. Uh, and generally, what you're taking advantage of is the non-classicality of them in whatever sense of non-classicality uh, you understand. Um, but in many ways, they're also quite weird in that they're an anomalous case for some uh, notions of non-classicality. So, for example, I mean, you can't prove Gleason's theorem for a single qubit. You can't prove the Cauchy-Specker theorem. Uh, and in this nice uh, relationship between um, where they show um, somehow how contextuality somehow allows you to do um, universal quantum computation in a certain scenario, this works for odd prime dimensions, but for even prime things uh, are sort of less obvious. Um, so I'm mainly going to look at the Cauchy-Specker aspect, so just a brief recap of the Cauchy-Specker theorem. So what it tells us is that there is no deterministic, non-contextual ontological model for quantum theory. Uh, so I'm going to enlist the help of my group to help explain this. Um, so uh, this is kind of the level that we live on, uh, and we see um, the statistics that we see, we can describe by some epistemic state, but in one of these models, there is kind of a, a, a layer underneath this where, oh, okay. Um, uh, so, and so every system uh, is actually in some ontic state and we can't necessarily figure out exactly which ontic state the system is in. Um, so, and this ontic state, so if this ontic state is called lambda, and say that these are three observables, um, then it deterministically uh, tells you exactly what value each of these observables have. Okay, so this is the deterministic part of the model. Um, and the, the non-contextual part is that so if we have two different contexts in which we can measure uh, an observable, for, so for example, we could measure um, an observable given by a function f of a by either uh, in some way directly measuring uh, that observable or by just measuring a first and then performing this function f of a on the outcome. So this is like two different contexts for measuring the same observable. Um, and so the non-contextual part of our model means that in the ontic state, we will get that um, the uh, value of the observable f of a is given by applying this function f to the outcome a. So then how does how is this supposed to recreate the probabilistic nature of quantum theory? So the idea is that the when we're in a quantum state this sh is um, supposed to uh, mean that we don't know exactly what the ontic state ontic state is but only with what with some probability which ontic state it's in. So for example uh, this psi could mean that with 50% chance we're in some ontic state lambda prime and with 50% chance we're in some uh, ontic state lambda. So then uh, we would know with like 50-50 chance whether we would get A or A prime. Um, and the Cauchy-Specker theorem says that uh, for quantum systems of dimension greater than two, then there is no one of the, you can't describe quantum theory by one of these models. Um, and there are kind of two general ways in which this theorem is proved. So the first kind of proof is known as a logical proof or a state independent proof. And there you're basically showing that there can't be one of these um, ontic states lambda, which does the thing that I was describing in the previous slide. Uh, and then on the other side, there is a statistical proof or a state independent proof where you take the statistics for a given quantum state and show that you can't uh, reproduce those by taking a mixture of uh, the lambdas that exist uh, on your set of measurements. So, so the way that we uh, find a logical proof 
Uh, so one sort of equivalent way of doing this uh, in general is that you can look for some uh, bases um, and then you consider measurements in those bases and then you try to assign exactly uh, you try to assign ones or zeros to every vector in those bases so that there is exactly one one in each basis. So for these three bases, for example, this is a valid assignment. So these three bases don't give you a logical proof, but if you add more and more bases, then you can uh, find that there is no way to assign these zeros and ones. Um, and uh, one of these assignments of zeros and ones is known as a KS coloring, a Cauchensbecker coloring. So on the other side, uh, for a statistical proof, uh, we're going to consider a given quantum state and then see for these measurements what statistics uh, this would produce. So in this example, we have uh, ones and zeros everywhere, but then we have uh, some halves, uh, some uh, non-deterministic probabilities here. And then the idea is to try and create these statistics by mixing together uh, these deterministic statistics on this side. So if I mix together the original ones with the switching the one and zero here, this would give me these statistics on this side. So then again here, this is not an example of a statistical proof, but if you consider different bases and different states, then you can demonstrate that. So they tend to look a bit more complicated. <laughs> Everyone always thinks this is a very embarrassing picture and they're probably right. So enjoy. <laughs> um, Okay, so then what's the case for a single qubit? So for a single qubit, we do actually have a, a KS coloring for all of the bases for a qubit. And this is kind of easy to see because every basis is just formed uh, by, so you can look at one point on the block sphere and then there's just one other element in the basis given by the opposite point. So then a way to assign zeros and ones to these like consistently is you assign one to everything in the Northern hemisphere and zero to everything in the southern hemisphere, and you're done. Um, and you can actually build a, a non-contextual ontological model using um, this, uh, these kinds of colorings, these ontic states, as long as you kind of rotate the, uh, the hemispheres. Um, but then for multi -cub multiple qubits, there is uh, no KS coloring of all of the bases for multiple qubits. And that implies that there is no non-contextual ontological model of this Cauchensbecker kind that I was describing. So then me and Ravi were looking at this and we were like, why? <laughs> or more specifically, how? Um, so what, what's the difference between a single qubit and multiple, multiple qubits? So maybe you think, ah, oh, you get entanglement when you have multiple qubits, but you could also think, ah, oh, you have non-locality or you have these other phenomena that appear once you go to the multi-qubit scenario. Um, and then one of the, the classic uh, proofs of um, the Cauchy-Specker theorem for two qubits looks like the Perez Mermin square. So it's not one of these hypergraphs I was showing you, but you can equivalently write it like that. But in this formulation, it kind of looks like there's no entanglement here. So what is happening? Um, and what I'm going to present to you, what I'm going to argue in this talk, is that uh, multi-qubit Cauchy-Specker contextuality requires both non-locality and entanglement. So not just one or the other, both at the same time. And this, I will mean this in multiple different ways, and I'll go through them now. So first, we need to divide up the different kind of bases that we can have uh, in a multi-qubit scenario. So uh, on the left, I've called these local bases because you can do a measurement in these bases using local operations and classical communication. So the first kind uh, is what's known as a direct product basis. So you just take a basis for the qubit, uh, the first qubit, a basis for the second one, and then take all the different tensor products and you form your two qubit basis. Um, there are this is not all of the local bases uh, that you can have. So there is uh, the bases in which you measure if you have some adaptive measurement strategy, which basically means one party does a measurement first and depending on what outcome they see, the other party uh, then can choose their measurement. Uh, so this, in this example, the, the first party measures in the zero one basis. 
So you can see that they always have zero or one, but then if they get the zero outcome, the second party measures in the zero one basis, but if they get the one outcome, they measure in the plus minus basis. So, uh, and this is like the overall measurement that they would perform with this strategy. Um, and, but then on the non-local side, so both of these you can see are formed from product vectors, but on the non-local side, we also have uh, bases that you, so you can't measure in them using only local operations and classical communication, but they are still only formed of, un uh, of product vectors. So uh, these are all the, uh, the product vector bases, the product bases, um, and some of them are on the non-local side, but some of them are on the local side. Uh, on the non-local side as well, we also obviously have the uh, entangled uh, bases because you can't measure in an entangled basis using only local operations and classical communication. Um, so uh, just to recap on this one, this is the, the, the if you know the phenomenon of uh, non-locality without entanglement, these bases are kind of what is responsible for that phenomenon as well. Um, okay, uh, so the first thing that we showed in this work is that the all of the, if you look at all of the unentangled bases in a multi-qubit system, then uh, this is KS colorable. So even though some of them are non-local, uh, we can still have a KS coloring for them. Um, and this KS coloring is quite easy to describe. So basically, um, you just look for the, so you, we find that there is exactly one state in every basis where each one uh, of the uh, vectors that you're taking a product of uh, is in the northern hemisphere of the, the qubit. So we call these all north uh, vectors and there is exactly one of these in every basis. So it's kind of easy to see that there can be at most one uh, because no two of these will be orthogonal to each other because you would need um, orthogonality for one of the parties and that can never happen if they're always in the northern hemisphere. But then with the slightly more work, you can show that there is always one of these. So then there is exactly one. Uh, and this is how we do our coloring, right? So we always, our coloring is that we assign one to the all north vector in every basis. Um, and our second result is that you can use these colorings to actually build uh, a KS non-contextual ontological model for the fragment of quantum theory consisting of unentangled measurements uh, and product states. Um, and it's based on, so there's like the uh, original caution specker non-contextual ontological model for a single qubit, which kind of uses these uh, colorings for a single one, single qubit, and it's an extension of that to the, the multi-qubit case, but it kind of uh, depends on our, on this first result in order to show that it's a valid uh, model. Um, this also extends to separable states, so the model becomes preparation contextual, but at the minute we're just worrying about uh, caution specker non-contextuality and it's still valid in that way. So what we've found so far is that if we have unentangled measurements, uh, then we can't have a logical proof. And if we have unentangled measurements and separable states, then we can't have a statistical proof of the KS theorem. So now what about entangled states? Um, so if we have unentangled measurements and entangled states, something we know is that we can have a statistical proof because every Bell inequality violation in the, is an example of a statistical proof uh, of the caution specker theorem. So uh, very quickly, uh, how this works in general is if so, so if you're in the CHSH Bell scenario, two parties, two inputs, two outputs each, each one of these dots corresponds to uh, a different measurement outcome, a different outcome in the scenario. Uh, and then one measurement will be given, we can collect those together. These four dots are all the outcomes of if both parties have a zero, zero setting. So then um, the probabilities that you would assign to those uh, that you could get in some strategy, those would have to sum to one because they're a complete measurement and the same for the other four. Um, you can also impose the non-signaling uh, conditions in this hypergraph form and that looks uh, something like this. Uh, so this is one example of a no signaling edge. So if 
if you want to be no signaling, then the probabilities that you assign to these outcomes have to sum to one also. And if you impose all of the non-signaling conditions, uh, you end up with a hypergraph like this. And then if you have some quantum strategy uh, to play your CHS, uh, CHSH game, uh, so these are just some measurements on a on a qubit for Alice and Bob to use in their measurement settings. Then this gives you an assignment of vectors to each of these um, measurement outcomes. And in, within every hyper edge, these vectors form a basis. And if you go through this strategy, what you find is that um, the non-contextual, uh, the the statistics that you can get from a non-contextual model are exactly those that you can get uh, from local co correlations in the Bell scenario. Um, so then if you can violate a Bell inequality, then you must be non-contextual, so then you have a proof uh, of contextuality. So this was already known. Uh, if you violate a Bell inequality, then you get a statistical proof of the caution specker theorem. Uh, but then what about the other direction? So every time I have some statistical proof of caution specker for vulnerable qubits, does that mean I can violate a Bell inequality? Um, so, and the reason that this is kind of a question is that there are, um, there are kind of multi-qubit bases which don't appear as one of these no signaling conditions or as one of the uh, global measurements in the Bell scenario. And these are exactly the, the bases that were behind this non-locality without entanglement as well. Um, but what we find uh, is that the, the kind of extra hyper edges that these can introduce uh, in the contextuality scenario compared to the non-signaling ones, they are kind of automatically satisfied in both the local and the quantum models um, uh, in, the, in the Bell scenario. So this basically means you don't get anything extra when you consider a contextuality scenario compared to a Bell scenario. Um, so then our third result is that um, you, so a state can give you a statistical proof of the caution specker theorem if and only if, uh, for multiple qubits, if and only if it violates a Bell inequality using some projective measurements. Uh, so this, so now I can describe uh, why I was uh, phrasing our result in uh, this way before, uh, where I was saying that for multi-qubit caution specker contextuality, you require both non-locality and entanglement. So in the first result, what we saw is that to get a, a logical pro a proof of the caution specker theorem, then you need um, measurements, you need to have uh, entangled vectors in the, the bases that you use. So if they're entangled, if your measurements are entangled, then they're also non-local. So here we have both non-locality and entanglement. Uh, in the second result, we found that if you combine unentangled measurements with separable states, then you have, there exists a non-contextual ontological model. So there's no way you're going to prove the KS theorem. And then in the third result, we showed that to have uh, a state dependent proof, uh, if you have only unentangled measurements, then your state must be non-local. So not only entangled, but also non-local. So able to violate a Bell inequality. So here again, we have non-local and entangled. So this kind of uh, justifies this statement that I was making. Uh, so finally, going back to this result uh, about um, contextuality providing the magic behind quantum computation, um, the kind of uh, context <laughs> for this um, statement is, so you're thinking about um, quantum computation via state injection, which means that you, uh, you, look, you use the stabilizer sub-theory of quantum theory, um, and then which we know to be classically simulable, so you're not going to be able to do universal quantum computation. But then, as well as the stabilizer states, which are included in the theory, you allow for some other states known as magic states. Uh, and if you choose the right states, this can elevate you to universal quantum computation. Um, and what was shown uh, by Mark uh, is that, uh, and others, um, is that 
if you want to elevate to universal com quantum computation, then you need that the magic states that you inject give you uh, a proof of the Cauchy-Specker theorem, a state a uh, state-dependent proof of the caution specker theorem with respect to the measurements that are allowed in the stabilizer sub-theory. Um, and then it was also conjectured for odd prime dimension that this also might be sufficient. Um, and uh, so apparently this conjecture has got slightly more complicated over time. <laughs> um, but uh, other people can tell you more about that than I can. Um, but. Uh, so the point I'm making here is that this uh, conjecture in the other direction doesn't make sense in the qubit case because you always have state independent contextuality in the qubit case. So then there's no way, and, th and this is classically simulable, so there's no way that um, you are going to, yeah, so, <laughs> um, so this conjecture like won't hold for qubits basically. And to try and um, deal with this problem and maybe uh, make contextuality a resource uh, for this kind of quantum computation again, people have res uh, suggested restricted um, quantum computation by state injection schemes. And in the examples that we found, basically what they do is they remove the entangled measurements. So then our result kind of shows you how this helps you, because if you re remove the entangled measurements, then um, you can see uh, what our result showed is you won't have the state independent proofs anymore. Um, have I run over? Uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> Um, so we also looked more generally uh, at these proofs of contextuality for composite systems. Um, so, so if you remember, uh, I showed you this uh, Perez Merman square at the beginning and was like, where is the entanglement? So I can now tell you the entanglement. So uh, in this scenario, you want to like simultaneously measure all of the observables, for example, in one row or one column. So if you want to measure these three in the final column, uh, simultaneously you have to measure in an entangled basis, right? So this is where the entanglement is in this case. But this then suggested to us, so this is a measurement in the Bell basis, so this suggested to us maybe you need bases which are fully entangled, so where every vector is entangled. So something that we showed is actually that this is unnecessary, so you can have so you don't need every vector uh, to be entangled in the hypergraphs that you're considering. And we also looked more generally at the relationship between uh, Gleason's theorem and the caution specker theorem. So, um, so there is a, an unentangled Gleason theorem, which was proved by Wallach, and I forgot to put the reference, sorry. Um, and so this is this result here. So if if you have multiple systems and all of their dimensions are greater than three, uh, then you can prove the Gleason's theorem using only unentangled measurements. And this implies that you can do the same for the caution specker theorem. Uh, and similarly, but if all of your systems are qubits, then what we showed here uh, is that you uh, can't prove the caution specker theorem uh, from the unentangled vectors alone. And this implies another result by Wallach that you can't prove the Gleason's theorem in this way. And then there's also an in-between case where you have a mixture of qubits and higher dimensional systems. And here you can't prove Gleason's theorem uh, from only unentangled measurements, but you can actually prove the caution specker theorem. So this is like the only case where these two things don't correspond. Uh, okay, so that's a summary of what we did in this work, uh, and here's the archive reference. Thanks for listening. Uh, questions? If not, I had a question about this, the fully entangled basis not being... So this is state independent, but like, yeah. how, how does this mm -hmm. work? So you have some partially entangled states? Yeah, so you, you have uh, bases where you have some entangled vectors but some product vectors in, uh, in the basis, right? So you, do, you can make a proof where there is no basis which only consists of entangled vectors. Okay. This is what we like, constructed some examples of.
So, like on extendable product bases? Is, is yeah, so it, this was where we were going with this, yeah, but yeah. we didn't find like an exact connection, right? So they, yeah, sure. they can feature in these, but they're not the only examples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. That was a really nice talk. Um, let's thank uh, Vicky again. Thanks to the organizers for this great conference and uh, thank you all for still being here. Um, I will tell you about a recent preprint by Robert, Jihan, Michael and me with the title Clifford Covariance of Wigner Functions, Positive Representation of Pauli Measurement and Cohomology. People try to grow Wigner Functions in different environments. In the case of QDITs with an odd number of internal states, uh, Wigner Functions grow very well. However, in the case of QDITs with an in even number D of internal states, they won't thrive. The goal of this work is to analyze the difference between these two environments and we find that it is cohomological. Let me first motivate uh, the question that we try to answer. The reason why we are interested in Wigner functions is quantum computation with magic states. As we have already heard, if we start out from magic states, it is sufficient to use only Clifford unitaries and only Pauli measurements to perform a universal quantum computation, at least uh, for prime D. Now, in odd dimensions, um, using gross wigner function, we have the following result. A quantum computation that consists of a product input state with non-negative Wigner function, Clifford transformations and finite Pauli measurements can be always efficiently classically simulated. This means that magic requires Wigner negativity. Let me go into the details of this result, starting by uh, recalling the Pauli group. A single QDIT is described by uh, basis states, by the autonomous basis states. In terms of these basis states, we can introduce the generalized Z and X operators. And from the Z and X operators, we can construct a basis of Pauli operators for N QDITs, which is shown here. Here, the Pauli labels uh, just tell you on which precise instance, uh, precise QDITs you have to apply the Z and X operators. Note that the definition of the Pauli operators depends on a phase convention, the phase convention gamma. If you multiply the Pauli operators together, we generate the Pauli group. And if we remove from the Pauli group all global faces, we obtain again the set of Pauli labels. The Clifford group consists of all unitaries that leave the Pauli group invariant, divided by the faces, by the phase factors. And if we divide the Clifford group by the Pauli labels, we end up with a symplectic group. Now let us have a look how a Clifford unitary acts on a Pauli operator. This action is actually characterized by a symplectic transformation of the Pauli label and a phase function. With this, we are ready to state the definition of gross Wigner function for odd dimensions. The Wigner function gives you the expansion coefficients of, some op uh, of any operator in some ortho uh, orthogonal basis of phase point operators. These phase point operators are symplectic Fourier transforms of Pauli operators, where this um, bracket denotes the symplectic internal product. And uh, the Pauli operators that um, Gross uh, chooses have this particular phase convention. How does, uh, um, which properties do allow us to prove that magic requires Wigner negativity in terms of uh, gross Wigner function? There are two main ingredients. The first one is Clifford covariance. It tells us that a Clifford group element acts on phase point operators by shifting them around according to this affine symplectic transformation. This means that if we start with a state with non-negative Wigner function and apply a Clifford unitary, we end up with a state with non-negative Wigner function and the update of the Wigner function can be efficiently computed. And the second main ingredient is the positivity of Pauli measurement. Gross Wigner function fulfills traceality in this form. In addition to that, any projector pi on an eigenspace of a Pauli operator is, uh, has a non-negative representation. This means that if we have a state with a non-negative representation, 
then we can sample the measurement outcomes of Pauli measurements from a classical prob probability distribution. Note also that Clifford unitors are actually not necessarily re required for uh, quantum computation with magic states, as soon as one allows the Pauli measurements to be intermediate and not only final measurements. Now, most of the quantum hardware uh, we know uses qubits and not uh, odd uh, d qubits. But what about the qubit uh, case with d even? Unfortunately, the, it is not possible to define gross Wigner function there. First of all, the phase convention that Gross uses is not well defined at all. You cannot divide, divide by 2 modulo d if d is even. And second, one can check, for example, for the one qubit case, that no matter which phase convention gamma you choose, you will never end up with Clifford covariant phase space operators, if, uh, phase point operators, if you define the phase point operators the same way as Gross does as uh, the symplectic Fourier transform of Pauli operators. Then the main question for this talk is whether we can construct a different kind of Wigner function such that magic still requires Wigner negativity in the even d case. And the answer that we give, of course, conditioned on some assumptions about what the Wigner function is, is no, and we give this answer in terms of cohomology. Cohomology um, is a mathematical concept that relates different, field, uh, different um, yes, uh, um, parts of quantum computing, for example, contextuality, measurement-based quantum computation, fault tolerance, and to this web of cohomology, we want to add Wigner functions for quantum computation with magic states. To define what the cohomological modul module is, we have to start with a chain complex. A chain complex is a sequence of ring modules uh, which are connected by boundary homomorphisms. And these boundary homomorphisms have the property that the kernel, uh, sorry, that the image of one boundary homomorphism uh, lies always inside the kernel of the next one. So the concatenation gives zero. Now, the homology module is just the kernel of the boundary map divided by its image. Each chain complex comes with a cochain complex, and in the cochain complex, the uh, R modules are replaced by homomorphisms from the R module into the ring itself, and the co-boundary map acts on um, such a homomorphism by, act, uh, by applying the boundary map to its argument. And uh, the cohomology module is now the kernel of the co-boundary map divided by its image. How does this enter the construction of uh, Wigner functions? Wigner uh, functions can be constructed starting from the basis of Pauli operators, and as we have seen, the definition of Pauli operators depends on the phase convention. In principle, we could now ask us, uh, ourselves for every single instance of phase convention whether a desired property of the Wigner function that we construct is actually fulfilled. However, Using gamma invariant cohomology classes allows us to transition to a much uh, more concise and convenient formulation of the que question, namely whether a property is at all fulfillable for any phase convention gamma. We use three different cohomological objects. The first one um, generalizes the phase function beta. Well, two Pauli operators commute if and only if the symplectic inner product vanishes. For such commuting, pairs of Pauli operators, the multiplication uh, is characterized by a phase function beta. And this phase function can be seen as an element in a, a cochain complex. To construct this cochain complex, we set C0 to Zd. C1 is a freely generated uh, Zd module generated by the Pauli labels. C2 is uh, freely generated by pairs of Pauli labels which commute, and C3 by triples of uh, pairwise commuting Pauli labels. The boundary map that we use is the boundary map, map from simplicial topology. For example, for this phase AB, it assigns the bound, uh, as a boundary A, B, and A plus B. The important thing on this slide is uh, only the last line. Uh, namely that beta represents an element of the second cohomology module and that two different instances of beta differ only by the choice of phase convention if and only if both of them are in the same cohomology class. The second object we use 
is uh, related to another phase function, uh, the phase function phi tilde. Recall that phi tilde characterizes the action of a Clifford group element on Pauli operators. To uh, interpret phi tilde as an element of a co-chain complex, we have to remove the commutativity conditions from the chain complex that we have already introduced, and we have to um, move over uh, on to a bi-complex, because phi tilde depends not only on the Pauli label, it also depends on the group element. In this bi-complex, the um, co-chain complex, the elements look like this, so they are maps from the Clifford group or powers of the Clifford group into maps from Pauli labels into ZD. And such a bi-complex comes with two co-boundary maps. One of them, the vertical one, is the one which I have already mentioned, and the horizontal one is a standard um, co-boundary map from group cohomology. Here I give an example of its action. Again, the important information is that phi tilde represents an element of the first group cohomology uh, module, and two instances of phi tilde are gamma equivalent if and only if they are in the same cohomology class. Finally, it turns out that we do not need all the information which is encoded in phi tilde, uh, instead of uh, considering the Clifford group, we can consider the uh, quotient of the Clifford group by the Pauli labels. Theta assigns to each equivalence class a representative of this equivalence class from the Clifford group. And then we observe that if we apply phi tilde only to boundaries, then the result depends only on the equivalence class and not on the Clifford group element itself. Therefore, we can define phi covariance as a function only on the quotient and on boundaries. And again, as you might have guessed, uh, phi covariance represents an element of the first uh, group cohomology module, and two instances of phi covariance are gamma equivalent if and only if they're in the same uh, cohomology class. I have uh, mentioned already that the two main ingredients for the connection between Wigner functions and quantum computation with magic states are Clifford covariance and the positive res representation of Pauli measurements. So let me start with Clifford, our results on Clifford covariance. We consider only Wigner functions that are constructed from operator bases. Recall that the action of a Clifford group element on Pauli operators is characterized by this symplectic matrix. We call um, basis of phase point operators and the associated Wigner function Clifford covariant if and only if the Clifford group elements shift uh, phase point operators around according to this symplectic affine transformation. With this I can state uh, our first main result, namely that a Clifford covariant operator basis exists if and only if the uh, cohomological class of phi covariance is zero. In the forward direction, we prove this by expanding a knot in Pauli operators and comparing the uh, action of Clifford unitaries and Pauli operators on a knot. In the backward direction, we know that we can choose gamma such that phi covariance become, uh, becomes identically zero, and then we can show that uh, gross phase point operators provide you a Clifford covariant operator basis. Now, for, uh, in even dimensions, we observe that the cohomology class of phi covariance never vanishes, which implies, with the previous theorem, that the Clifford covariant Wigner function does not exist. For qubits, the uh, result of theorem 2 has been known already from a paper by Ju from 2016 um, without any uh, reference to cohomology. So, to prove this central lemma, we find an element G of the Clifford group and the phase F such that these two properties hold. These two properties are inconsistent with the vanishing cohomology class of phi covariance. Now, as I have mentioned before, um, though we do not have Clifford covariance, we can still hope to have a similar proof, similar relation between uh, quantum computation with magic states and uh, Wigner functions in even dimensions, because Clifford unitaries are not necessary for quantum computation with magic states. Therefore, let us consider the positivity of Pauli measurements. For this result, we assume a bit more than 
uh, before, namely the whole set of what we call the stratonovich wild criteria. The Wigner function is now not only assumed to be constructed from an operator basis, but also um, to fulfill reality standardization and Pauli covariance. Of course, gross Wigner function indeed does fulfill uh, these uh, conditions. Um, the traceality condition uh, allows us to define a function theta, which is dual to the Wigner function, which we construct here. With this, we can say that Pauli measurements are positively represented if and only if the dual representation of any Pauli projector is non-negative, and if you stay, uh, start with a state with non-negative Wigner function and perform a Pauli measurement, the post-measurement state also has a non-negative Wigner function. Obviously, the second condition is necessary to allow for intermediate Pauli measurements. Then our next main result is that um, Wigner functions that satisfy the stratonovich weil criteria can represent Pauli measurements positively if and only if the cohomology class of beta vanishes. For the forward proof, we expand the phase point operators and Pauli operators. Then we express the dual representation of Pauli projectors um, in a corresponding way. Use, the Bo uh, use Bochner's theorem, which is about uh, the positivity of Fourier transforms, and um, apply this form of the multiplication rule, which depends on beta. In the backward direction, it is very similar to what I have uh, shown before. We know that we can choose gamma such that beta identically vanishes, and then gross um, phase point operators provide you with a Wigner function that satisfies the straton rich y criteria and represents Pauli measurements positively. Uh, I should admit that the proof is currently under internal review because during QPL, I got the impression that one of the steps is not yet completely precise. <laughs> I hope that we will uh, have it more precise soon. <laughs> what does this mean for even dimensions? In even dimensions, we find that if we have two or more qubits, then the cohomology class of beta can never vanish. This means that the Wigner function that, in this case, the Wigner function that satisfies the Stratonovich criteria cannot represent all Pauli measurements positively. There is a closely related result by a uh, recent result by Schmidt and others, um, where they show that no positive, uh, there exists no positive diagram preserving representation of the entire stabilizer subtheory for any n. Yes. To prove this lemma. We use a generalization of Merman square, or in cohomological language, we find the phase such that the boundary of the phase vanishes, but the beta function does not. This is incompatible with the vanishing cohomology class of beta. And with this, I'm ready to summarize our results. We have found that particular properties of Wigner functions require particular environmental uh, conditions. And these environmental conditions are cohomological. First, sorry, first, uh, a Clifford covariant operator uh, basis exists if and only if the cohomology class of phi covariants equals zero. And second, there exists a Wigner function that satisfies the stratonovich weil criteria and represents Pauli measurements positively if and only if the cohomology class of beta equals zero. For even dimensions, we find that the Clifford covariant Wigner function does not exist at all. And um, if we have two or more even dimensional qubits, a Wigner function cannot satisfy the Stratonovich weil criteria and represent all Pauli measurements positively. These results are presented in this uh, preprint. How can we uh, go on from here? Uh, regarding Clifford covariance, I think it would be interesting to uh, consider different actions of the Clifford group on the phase space than the one which I have used in the definition of Clifford covariance. More importantly, for Pauli positivity, it would be nice uh, to remove some of the assumptions from our result, in particular the assumption of Pauli covariance. But what is probably most interesting is that our results point out that it is important to study Wigner functions that are not constructed from operator basis, 
or maybe even non-unique. And indeed, there have been already examples of non-unique Wigner functions in the literature by Howard and Campbell, Rausendorf et al., and Zurel et al. And interestingly, um, in the last paper, we have a representation that uh, lacks any negativity at all, so that negativity cannot uh, be a resource in this model anymore. And it becomes an interesting open question whether another quantity can be defined as an uh, interesting resource. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Oh, yeah, I, I could see you were thinking. So you, <clears throat> you kind of preempted it in your bullet point there about saying different actions on phase space. So um, is there something to be said for just uh, allowing permutations on phase space, but not, is that the minimum kind of assumption that you'd want um, for, your, for your definition of how a Clifford acts on phase space? I, I think if you just allow permutations in addition, it does not change anything. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, when I was thinking about why we choose this particular action, apart from historic reasons, because it has been uh, yeah, observed in the odd dimensional case, my first goal was to check whether it is unique up to permutations, because I think uh, permutations do not add anything interesting. But what I really would like to know, I mean, I could not show this, and it's probably not true. <laughs> what I really would like to know is whether there are uh, really different actions that one could consider that are not equivalent up to permutation. Uh, okay, I go. Well, maybe I'll work. Hi, thank you. Um, that you can make other Wigner functions. That, for example, you can define a Wigner function on the sphere using a spin system. And there's a result by Steven Weigart that shows that if trying to create a spherical lattice rather than a continuous sphere with a Wigner function, it's actually impossible. And I'm just curious if there's some sort of relationship between this impossibility of a, uh, of a discrete Wigner function on a spherical lattice and this uh, inability to build a Clifford covariant Wigner function on it. Oh, sorry, could you repeat, please? Uh, what is spherical in this other construction? In this case, the phase space itself is spherical, uh -huh. as opposed to a d by d lattice. And then the idea would be to try and build a, a non-redundant version of the spherical Wigner function by finding a, a spherical lattice of, like a, of a d by d. And there's this, but, the, but there's a proof that says that uh, that's impossible. And so I was just curious. It seems like it's related to this impossibility of. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. of what you showed. Yes, interesting. I, I don't know about these results. Uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting to know. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Cole? Um, yeah, you said that the, this theta is dual to the Wigner function. I didn't understand what, what is meant by dual in this case. So I would say that uh, uh, we call it dual just by um, by the definition, um, by the way how it uh, appears in the traceality condition, um, but you can uh, go also a bit further. So um, I think uh, that if you start with an operator basis, you can always define a dual operator basis, right? Um, which uh, will be so both bases in itself do not need to be orthonormal, uh, but with respect to each other, they will be if I remember correctly. And uh, this second um, basis will define you the dual of the Wigner function in the same way as the first basis defines you the Wigner function. But in this particular case, so I think it, these definitions coincide, but in this particular case, um, you will see that uh, theta is just from this equation. Yes, uh, theta is defined as uh, the trace of the operator of which you want to compute it with a phase point operator. And uh, you may have seen that uh, for Wigner functions, this is often the definition of the Wigner function itself. But 
this is possible only if uh, your operator basis is orthogonal and that's self-dual that you um that these things coincide otherwise you will have like two bases you can define two functions like one will be trace operator one of the basis elements the other will be trace operator an element of the other basis and they will be dual to each other such that they in the sense that they fulfill this traceality condition thanks for the clarification okay let's thank uh, paulina again Hello everyone, uh, I'm Shomshankar Bhattacharya, I'm a postdoc in ICTQT Gdansk. And uh, so this is a work uh, in collaboration with uh, Shutapa Shah, Tabal Guho and Manik Banik, uh, my collaborators from India. And uh, in this work, we talk about a very uh, specific class of computing, uh, computation and a very uh, restricted uh, kind of uh, physical setup where there are multiple, there could be multiple parties uh, who receive uh, some bit strings and they have to calculate this very specific uh, type of uh, computation on it. And um, so, so uh, this, is, this is a especially a distributed computing setup with, with, uh, with, the, uh, with some very specific type of uh, computation keeping in mind. And we show that um, there is a separation between uh, classical quantum and some of the post-quantum theories um, the while computing, uh, while deterministically calculating, computing these functions, okay? So first I will tell you about uh, the type of computation we are looking at, and then I will tell you the physical setup in which uh, these parties are trying to um, calculate the values. And uh, then I will tell you um, what are the uh, possible, uh, what are the class of uh, functions of uh, computations that could be done using only classical resources and then quantum resources and then some uh, post quantum resources. Okay, so I will start by uh, showing the specific type of computation that we are trying to do. Uh, it is called a dual layer computation because uh, there are like this computing device has two different layers, two separate layers. So there is, let's say there is some server from which this device is uh, getting some two bit strings, each of length N. And then the first layer is actually performing some bitwise operations, okay? And then this out outcomes of this first layer is coming into the next layer. And here this big F operation, it is actually performing uh, on, the, on all of the outputs of the first layer and finally giving some bit output, okay? So this big F function is actually uh, a mapping from this N bits to a single bit. Okay, so this is, this is uh, the dual layer computation that we are look, trying to uh, do, I mean, in a, in, in a physical setup. So now I come to the setup. Okay, so this is uh, called distributed computing with limited communication. Why limited communication? I will tell you. So this is acronym, we have acronymed it as DCLC N. Here the N means that what is the length of the bit string that uh, these uh, two systems receive, okay? So the setup is this, that on, on the first, uh, on, on the, uh, on the first um, uh, uh, here, here you will see that the, the first the distribution happens. Uh, this server distributes this n-bit string to Alice, n-bit string to Bob. And uh, Alice and Bob uh, try to encode uh, this bit string into some physical system here on Alice's device and also on Bob's device. And they may have some pre-shared state uh, to do this, but after this game starts, they cannot change this state. So they, they also cannot communicate among themselves. And so this is the encoding part. And in the transmission part, they can send this encoded system to some third uh, decoding device, which is Charlie, let's say. And uh, this communication, this communication is bounded by, uh, because you see, if, if Alice could communicate as much as all the bits, then it would be trivial for Charlie to compute any function, any possible function. 
So uh, definitely this, how much you can communicate that is limited. And that is why the name distributed computing with limited communication. And finally, when uh, this uh, finally decoding device, Charlie, receives uh, this um, input from uh, encoded systems from both Alice and Bob, uh, he will perform some uh, measurement here, two outcome measurement. And finally, we want the measurement to be of this form, of this dual layer form. So given some function, bitwise function, uh, small f and some big function, capital F, uh, then uh, both the, the target of Alice and Bob and Charlie is to encode and decode in such a way that this function is actually calculated on any arbitrary string that is given to uh, Alice and Bob. Okay, so now uh, let's see that what are the, what is the limitation for the communication? Because if you want to uh, put some operational uh, restriction on the communication because they could encode the system in 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 many different possible um, uh, possible with many different possible uh, descriptions. So uh, you, we we need to have something to compare between these possible different uh, descriptions. Uh, and so uh, let's say they all have some fixed operational dimension. So by operational dimension, I mean that whatever be the theory is, but it is the largest cardinality of the states, uh, which can be perfectly distinguished by performing a single measurement. So the point is to perform a single measurement and how many different states can you uh, distinguish, perfectly distinguish in one go. So that is uh, what is defined as the operational dimension. In literature, people also uh, refer to this as measurement dimension sometimes. Okay. And then uh, they can also share some pre-shared, um, they can also have some pre-shared correlation between encoders. And that could be some joint state uh, defined by some bipartite state. And uh, this may have some arbitrary bipartite uh, state space also. Right, and also the local systems, the local systems are uh, having this operational systems with, uh, with this operational dimension. D, let's say, so both of them have the same operational dimension. And this D and this op D dimensional, the, this operational dimension has to be uh, less than the bit string. I mean, the has to be uh, less than uh, two to the power N. So that is what um, we need to have uh, to have uh, limited communication, okay. And then what, how, how does the encoding happen? Encodings are some local reversible transformations on Alice's side and Bob's side. So depending on the inputs uh, on Alice's side X, uh, Alice will perform some uh, local reversible transformation, tau X, and Bob will do likewise. So this is uh, the encoding part. And then the transmission is that they actually send this uh, system of local dimension D to this distant computer. Uh, which is personified as Charlie. And then Charlie is going to perform a global measurement on these two systems that uh, he obtains. And uh, this is uh, some, some uh, I'm sorry, so there is something that I did not want to put. But anyway, so Charlie is going to perform some global measurement and this global measurement could also belong to any arbitrary effect space. Um, which is uh, denoted by this epsilon AB. And the only condition is that uh, they have to be, uh, uh, they have to sum up to some uh, unit effect in the, and uh, they, they also need to provide uh, positive uh, probabilities on the, uh, on the bipartite uh, states. Okay, uh, so after the, after the measurement, the outcome actually needs to be of this form, okay? So given some small f and this capital F, Bob, uh, Charlie has to finally obtain uh, the outcome of this function. So this is uh, the physical setup in which uh, we try to compute this uh, dual layer uh, functions. Right, now I would like to um, talk about uh, some characterization of these um, functions, which could be actually calculated by classical uh, resources. So 
we will uh, look at the trivial computation. So we call this the trivial computation. So whenever uh, this dual layer computation, uh, which is denoted by this big F and this small F, is uh, can be can be done exactly by with with some classical strategy by sending bits. Uh, then we call it uh, trivial. And whenever it cannot be done perfectly, so we will see that there exist certain uh, computations for capital F and small f, which cannot be done by sending. Um, sending uh, classical bits of limited um, dimension, uh, those are uh, those are called the non-trivial computations. And then, if you look at if you look at the DCLC two, which is like uh, both Alice and Bob are given some two-bit string, uh, that is uh, the scenario of DCLC two. In that case, you can actually uh, uh, characterize all the trivial computations that there could be. So they could be of this three out of one of these three possibilities. That means that the function could be any one of these f and small f. Uh, that could be a constant function. That means either zero or one, or it could be uh, one of them could be one of them could be a single bit function like not or the identity or uh, either f is symmetric on inputs, that means f acting on a1 and a2 is same as a2 and a1, or and f uh, small f can be uh, realized through f. That means that uh, it is almost the same as f, either this way, or you take a not on the inputs, and then you uh, find that these two functions are the same. So these are the only three possibilities in which uh, the functions could be trivial. Uh, this computation could be trivial in the uh, in the, in the case where both Alice and Bob receive uh, uh, two bit strings, the bit strings of length two. Okay, so now uh, what about uh, the quantum scenario or even the GPT scenario? So this is uh, this is the second result which uh, tells that uh, a characterization of all the non-trivial computations that could be done with uh, quantum strategies. I mean, that is by sending a qubit. So because we are here uh, talking about the bit strings of length two, so both Alice and Bob can send a qubit to Charlie. And uh, the all those dual layer computations, uh, which are non-trivial and also have this small f function as a balanced function like the ZOR, uh, then it can be calculated perfectly uh, with quantum strategies. And if not, then quantum uh, may not, uh, I mean, there is no deterministic strategy for performing this computation with quantum resources, but it could be probabilistically calculated. Okay, so if you, if I, if you generalize this scenario, even to DCLCN that both Alice and Bob received the uh, uh, bit strings of length N, even then, uh, this remains as a uh, sufficient condition for uh, this. Uh, if is a if a, if is a balanced function, then quantum can compute it. But there could be some more non-trivial computations which uh, may not be of this form. But even uh, then, quantum uh, may perform it. Uh, so it is not a necessary constraint on this uh, type of computations for uh, quantum realization. Okay, so now uh, another another uh, necessary condition for performing this uh, non-trivial computation in any uh, generalized probabilistic theories, which could be more general than quantum mechanics. And uh, it necessitates, uh, so we prove that a necessary condition to uh, perfectly perform this uh, non-trivial computations is that uh, the state shared between Alice and Bob has to be entangled and also the uh, measurement performed by uh, Charlie has to be uh, has to contain some entangled uh, elements. So these are the necessary conditions to perform a non-trivial computation, but it may not be sufficient again uh, because uh, there may see may some may be some hard computation which may not even um, uh, allow you to compute even with some powerful bipartite states and effects. Okay, so 
what we, we also looked at looked at some uh, special kind of generalized probabilistic theories you have already uh, heard about this earlier today uh, these are the polygon theories this has a special um, place in uh, literature because um, they also give rise when considered bipartite system they also give rise to uh, post quantum like non local uh, resources and uh, okay so these are the state spaces of these uh, generalized probabilistic theories are like this uh, square or pentagon something like this and you also have the fx spaces like this so you have already uh, seen pictures of these earlier today so uh, so the point here is that uh, the operational dimension of all of these polygon theories is also two so you can compare it to uh, bits and qubits and uh, what we find here is that uh, none of the non-trivial computations in DCLC2 can be perfectly done uh, by these uh, polygon theories, uh, which are like symmetric polygon state spaces. So this is uh, one interesting thing because uh, although quantum, quantum can perform some of the non-trivial uh, computations, but these uh, polygon state spaces are useless also they although they give some uh, post-quantum uh, non-local correlations, maybe um, can reproduce some other features, but for this kind of dual layer, non-trivial computations, they are not very useful. Okay, so I will summarize uh, my talk by presenting you this schematic of all the computations that one can think of in BCLC2 with bit strings too. Uh, so there are this, uh, there is this set of uh, trivial computations, which is uh, shown in the with uh, with the red line, and it is uh, it has been fully characterized in our work. And uh, there, then there is this uh, blue line, which contains all the uh, computations that you could do with quantum resources deterministically. So this is this we we have also fully characterized for DCLC2, but for DCLCN, we know a necessary condition, but a sufficient condition, but uh, no necessary condition. Okay, and uh, then there is this uh, set H, which are the hard computations here in, in, in the intermediate region. So this may not be possible even to uh, perform with some uh, fixed dimensional quantum uh, communication between Alice, Bob and Charlie. And uh, so, so there are there there are examples like this where this capital F is some ZOR function and the small f is some AND function. So this could not be perfectly probabilistically done by, uh, but maybe uh, not uh, deterministically, but maybe probabilistically done by uh, quantum theory. And there could also be uh, some intermediate uh, space where uh, quantum could provide probabilistic adv advantage over. Uh, over other GPTs, sorry, uh, it should not be polygon GPTs, maybe some other GPTs also. But uh, that example, uh, we have not yet seen with the available GPTs, okay? So that's all, uh, but what remains is that uh, to quantify, uh, to, to characterize all the computations uh, in more general scenario, like when the bit strings are more than length two, uh, and also about uh, finding uh, the set of trivial computations in uh, for higher number of uh, bit strings, and because there will be uh, many more other possibilities rather than those three possibilities that uh, I have shown you. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? If not, I had a question about uh, how this relates to communication complexity, because if I think about with PR boxes, I can, with distributing enough boxes, I can trivialize any yes. computation, right? So I was trying to understand how that relates. Yes, yes. So you see that um, this setting is a little bit different. I mean, if Alice could communicate directly to Bob, that could have been the scenario of um, communication complexity, right? Because uh, then they are sharing some entangled state and then Alice communicates to Bob. 
But here the point is uh, actually Bob also does not have uh, uh, this Charlie who is actually calculating this oh, I see. Uh, function right. does not have access to any of these. So uh, oh, I then see. it okay. makes right. uh, it, this task difficult for Charlie to do. So this is okay. danger. In a sense, it is uh, a, a harder task than uh, communication. Yeah, context. I see. Yeah. I see. So Charlie is like a referee in a yes. like a non-local who, game type yes. situation. Okay, right. Who has okay. no information about the input bit strings? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. If that's uh, thank the speaker again.